So listen, I want to jump right into our topic today. Um, we're going to be discussing a story out of the book of uh, Judges right after I do this part. Grab your Bible and join me in our covenant prayer. Your Bible's on your phone. That's fine. Join with me. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praise for you or criticize for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, a wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. Thank you. So, if, uh, now that you have your Bibles handy, see that, what I did there? Um, you can uh, turn to Judges, find chapter 6, and we're going to talk about Judges. Now, I know a lot of you are having trouble reading that. If you had the app on your phone, you could go to our sermon series today and push on the slide deck, and you could actually follow along the slides. That was a shameless plug for the church app. And uh, you can do the same thing online if you're watching. You can find the PowerPoint presentation for everything that we're doing today online. But one of the things you probably might notice right away from that diagram, Judges is a mess. The book is a, it's a history of what happened to the Jewish nation after Joshua died. Moses died. Joshua came along. Joshua died. And then there was no one left. There was no successor to Joshua. So there became this, this leadership void in the nation of Israel. And so if you go back and look at the book of Judges, what you're going to discover is that it's messy. And without a leader, what God would do is he would come alongside a person and he would lift them up as a judge. And not like Judge Trapp with the black robe and you got a big old gavel that you bang? Yeah. 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 Does he ever let you bang it? No? Okay. So not that kind of a judge, even though we love those kind of judges, not that kind of judge. It's the kind of judge that he would lift up, usually a leader type, leader type a charismatic type, to help them get out of their, their problems. Because what happened was they had this habit of being a peaceful nation, and then they would start going back to idolatry and sinning. And so God would say, you want to worship other gods, you're on your own, and he would leave them be. And so what happens, they would be oppressed by other countries coming in and fighting them. And of course, you know what happens next. It's, God, what happened to you? Why did you leave us? We promise we'll never do it again. And so God will lift up a judge to deliver them from their problem, and there's a period of peace. This is what the book of Judges is about, this never-ending cycle over and over and over again through 12 Judges. The whole period of time, from the time Joshua dies to the first judge through Samson, the last judge, is about a little over 300 years. How long have we been a country? 248 years officially. We've been fledgling as a country for longer than that. So when we get to the end of the book of Judges, it doesn't have a very good ending. The end of the book of Judges is very disturbing. It's graphic, it's horrible, there's death, there's destruction, and evil. And at the very end of the period of time after Samson's gone, before the first king is asked to come forward, there's a civil war. The tribes are now fighting amongst themselves. <clears throat> so the judge we're going to 
talk about today is part of one of those people that God would bring along to try to renew the people. You know, it, it, as a country, we, we, we have our cycles we go through. We tend to call our cycles that we go through um, when we come up an, an awakening or, or the big revivals. Times of peace, we go to war, we struggle with our faith, we struggle with evil, we have another great awakening, and we've seen this over and over in our country. So when you get to chapter 6 in Judges, this is where we find Gideon. And the story of Gideon is probably one of the most popular stories uh, in the Bible. I remember hearing about Gideon when I was little in Sunday school, and frankly, I think it's popular because it's so darn funny. Right? I mean, Gideon's like this not overly sensitive about who he's talking to kind of person. And he keeps challenging God, well, can you make, bring water out of this piece of um, cowhide? In chapter 7, he says, you know, um, he, he gets told, to, I'm gonna, how are he supposed to pick his troops? And, and I know there's not a man here that has read Gideon that didn't pay attention to this because the only people he would choose are the ones that lapped water like a dog. And most of us still can't figure that one out. So the whole part of the first cha- two chapters is actually, it's pretty funny. And, and my plan was I was going to retell the story of Gideon. And I was, it was going to be a really uplifting sermon about how uh, um, God calls us in our darkest times. And he raises us up to all do great things. And there's so much potential inside all of us. That's what I was going to preach. That's not what's going to happen. As usual, God read my draft and said, No, David, you're missing the entire point of the story for the year 2024. Buckle your seatbelts. Let's see where this goes. So here we are in chapter 6. We're in a... uh, I'll just start reading it. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abezerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Okay, so you've got Gideon in a hole threshing wheat. Normally you thresh wheat out in the air so that it would help separate the chaff from the wheat. You know, it would, the, but he's down in a hole. Because he's worried that the Midianites could attack at any time. He wants to be able to protect his crop from being stolen. And the angel of the Lord came down. Now the text says, the angel of the Lord. That means God in person. Not an angel, the angel. God came to see Gideon. Gideon doesn't know who he is. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said... The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Oops. Let me find my spot. There we go. And he says, pardon me, Lord. Gideon replied, but the Lord is with us. Why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said... Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us unto the hand of Midian. So you have to think about Gideon a little bit, how old he might be, 20, 25, 30 years old. We have to kind of backfire because how long his his 40-year reign is going to be. But he's a young adult. He's never seen these atrocities that he's heard about from the previous judges that they've had to resolve. They're only 200 years away from entering Canaan. Think about our forefathers, the founders of this country. In the late 1700s, the late 1500s were not that far off in their mind. They understood the sacrifices that were made to settle and tame the land. So Gideon has that perspective. He's heard the stories but he's never had to experience it until this last seven years. And he's saying, hey, where have you been, Lord? And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? 
Well, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied. He was cocky, wasn't he? He doesn't know who he's talking to. But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord says, I'll be there with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. So let me back up just a little bit. How do you think Gideon's feeling right about now? This big, bright, shiny fellow has showed up telling him that he's going to send them off to war and they're going to defeat the enemy. And he's tried to explain to him, you, you got the wrong guy, Lord. Have you, have you looked around at this little town? Have you looked at my family? I am the least of the least. What are you doing picking me? And by the way, who are you? Can you show me your ID? <laughs> so he says, please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And I imagine God kind of chuckled and said, I'll wait until you return. I'm missing a slide. So Gideon goes off, he prepares a meal of, of lamb and bread, and, and he brings it back, and he puts it on a rock. And the Lord takes his staff, and he touches it, poof, it turns into fire, goes up to smoke, and that's when Gideon has his aha moment. Uh-oh, this is really God. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And the Lord said to him, peace. Do not be afraid, you're not going to die. Now after this, we know that Gideon builds an altar to God right there because he's so enthralled. And then he probably goes back home where later that night, God calls to him. Because God has a special plan for Gideon. And this mission has nothing to do with the Midians but it has everything to do with this sermon today. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal, and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build the proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offering the second bull as a burnt offering. So this is where we get the surprise in the text. It turns out that Gideon's family is the keeper of the idols to other gods. His father, Joash, evidently is kind of the religious leader of this town. And in front of their home is the image of the bull, god Baal, and the pole of the goddess Asherah. His family, they're, they're members of this tribe of Israel who God saved from slavery less than 200 years before. He led them into the promised land. They are in the promised land of Canaan, and they're actively worshiping other gods. No wonder God turned his back on them. When a nation is built by God, you are to continue to worship God. How about our country? What's happened to our trust in God? painted on the courthouse. It's on our money. What's happened to our trust in God? In the last 40 years, Christianity has dropped down from 73% attendance in church to less than 45% today. Less than half the people attend church and probably a good chunk of those that do are struggling in their faith as well. What happened to our trust in God? 
as Christians, we have to be worried about this lack of discipleship because frankly, isn't that our job? To make disciples for Christ? We're not doing a very good job if attendance is dropping from 73% to less than 45% in two generations. Our generations. But here's the thing. Sadly, there's a forces of evil sweeping across our country. And there's only way to fight Satan. And the answer is right back in that last verse I showed you from Judges 6. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole behind it. Then build the proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top. Does anyone know who Baal and Asherah even are? Baal is the god of the Canaanites. And they claimed he controlled the weather and the crops. And in exchange for his benevolence, all you had to do was offer up animal sacrifices, human sacrifices, child sacrifices, and even temple prostitution as a sacrifice. That's all you had to do. Asherah, she was called the mother of all the gods with the little g. She claimed that she could heal the earth. Her worship was all about sex, life, and earth's bounty. And people would worship her by gathering in sacred groves and adorning themselves in symbols and offering her food and drink to appease her. I think it's really a good thing that that, that worship the ball and that worship the Asherah was so, so long ago. Not so much. Right now, temples to Baal and Satan are being built all over this country and around the world. The satanic goat symbol of Satan was taken on a tour of the country. Satan with the goat head with two little children looking up adoringly at evil. If you all think that This isn't really happening, it's happening. At the opening of the Commonwealth Games two years ago with Prince Charles in attendance, a flagrant pagan worship to the God Baal. In front of the world, 72 nations attending going, okay, and no one complains. And because no one complained, what happens in the Olympics two weeks ago? open, flagrant disrespect for our Lord. And they got their hands smacked and you know they'll do it again. And I haven't talked to that topic since it happened, but I'm going to tell you this one thing. I looked at that, I watched it, I saw a picture and I went, eh, it's French. They were being avant-garde, and then I actually watched what they were doing. And I felt sorry for the people on the stage doing what they were doing because evil entered them. Satan grabbed them and put on that show in your faces. And yeah, a lot of people complained, it's going to happen again. But here's the thing, if you don't think child sacrifices are still going on, you're wrong. Those sacrifices to Baal, to Asherah, they're happening and it's real. According to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, Child sex trafficking is up 
846%. Let that thing sink in. In our country last year, over 375,000 children went missing. In the state of Texas, 35,181 children went missing. Homeland Security lost 85,000 children in their care last year. Where'd they go? They're being trafficked. Some are being sacrificed. Don't believe me? It's happening right here in Houston. These two guys just got 40 years for sacrificing a 15-year-old. Yes, child sacrifice is a thing. And so is child pornography. They called a man in Texas with 58 terabytes of child pornography. That's 45,000 hours of video of children being raped. Little boys and little girls being raped. And it's a news headline. Where's the outrage? We are now in an era of cultural obsession with pedophilia and child rape. Did you ever think that that would be a cultural thing? It's because pedophilia is being normalized. They're rebranding it. Some people are child lovers. Get over it. There's too many places in this country right now where they are literally redefining the word pedophilia to minor attracted people. Let me say that again. Those people that we used to castrate for raping children are now minor attracted people so they don't face any harsher charges. In California... They had legislation to ban the sale of children for sex. And the Senate Public Safety Committee said, no, we're not going to do that. Maybe it's because one of the people, the senators in California, is a pedophile, proudly. Can anyone tell me that we are not living Canaan in the year 60, 1162 when Gideon was called? How are we any different? We live in a culture of child sacrifice, human sacrifice, worshiping false idols. Where's our judges? And no one's trying to hide it. The idolatry of Satan is in our face. Our country is falling to the forces of evil and we're twiddling our thumbs watching it happen. And I don't know about you all, but my gut is churning. The Holy Spirit is telling me something is just wrong, wrong, wrong with our country, with our community. But too many Christians were just not listening. First of all, too many of them don't even want to believe it. Check your sources, David. I did. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The very first thing he asked Gideon to do was not get ready for battle with the Midianites, not to go pick his army. The very first thing he asked him to do is go into your own house and destroy the idols. 
So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in daytime. I don't blame him. If there was a Satan statue across the street in the courthouse, probably allowed by law, and the judge would say, no, you have to let it be, I would sneak over there in the middle of the night and cut its head off with a chainsaw. How many else would? I want to summarize the ending of this story. So Gideon, he goes and he destroys the idols. And he takes their wreckage and he builds an altar to God by burning the, 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 the bull as a sacrifice using the wood from the Asherah God. That is an in-your-face moment. And in the morning, the townspeople all discovered what had happened. And they're like, who did this? Who did this? And they find out it's Gideon. Bring him out here. We're going to kill him because he's stopping our ability to kill children. But his father stepped up. Remember I told you Joash? Was the one that erected the altar to Baal and the pole to Asherah. And Gideon went into that house that night and told him what the Lord had said to him. This isn't the Bible. I'm just conjecture, but why else would he have done it? Gideon changed the hearts of his family. And the next day when they came out and people were wanting Gideon, he said, if Baal is really a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down the altar. That's the attitude you need to have. How did this story of Gideon begin? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. This is why God called him the mighty warrior. Gideon was willing to face the enemy within his own family, within his own village, before he was ever ready to take on the Midianites. God put that before him first. Take care of the evil in your house. Then we'll worry about the evil coming across the border. He was ready to take on the evil and bring his family back to the one true God. Are you ready to be a Gideon? Are you ready to be a mighty warrior? Are you ready to go to battle against the forces of evil that are trying to tear down our country, our communities, your home, your family. You better be because you don't have any choice. Ball is already in your house. And the hard part most of you is that you don't even realize he snuck in. And the truth is, you probably paid for it. Our children are under attack. That's what they're after. Destroy the youngest generation and you'll never have to have another worry about the light shining again. All of you have seen the growing sexualization of children. I had to bite my tongue at a couple outfits at the VBS this year. I'm ashamed I did. Where they get this sexualization? They watch it on TV. They watch it on the movies. Disney, Pixar. I was going to show you a short clip of Rem and Stimpy from Nickelodeon, but it's too vulgar. It's too vulgar. And it's on the cartoon channel. But the worst of all is on the internet. Do you all know how people make money on the internet? People on social media? They do whatever they can to get people to watch, subscribe, like my channel. You know what those people are called? 
influencers. What are they influencing your children? They're doing everything they can to entice your children to come watch whatever debauchery they want to throw out there so they can make money. They could become famous, and there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of millionaires on YouTube, TikTok, and those other places. But what do they do with all that data? They're collecting data on all your children, on all your grandchildren. And they're looking at what they do, what they watch, where they are, how can we better influence them, and then they sell that data to other people. If you're on Facebook, and you're posting pictures of your kids and grandkids, they're taking those pictures and passing them around. Did you know that? Of course you knew that. But what are we going to do? God is calling for us to be the Gideons of our time. Does anyone remember how I said the book of Judges ended? Anybody? Civil War. What have we been hearing in the air lately? Civil War talk. Even made a Civil War movie so we'd know what it might look like. It's a frightening thought that makes me wonder if we're not on the verge of repeating history. If you look at the timeline, the cycles and the cycles were perfectly aligned to be right there when Samson went down and the Civil War started and the call for the monarchy began. That's where we're headed. I don't know that we could survive another cycle. Satan is the prince of this world. He thrives on division and chaos. And it seems like he's working overtime these days. Peter tells us that Praetor prowls like the lion and devours us. 35,000 missing last year. 85,000 children missing from homeland security. Yeah, he's devouring us. You know, it's easy to think that we just got a lot of really bad people. There's a lot of bad actors out there. Paul addresses that. In Ephesians 6.12, he says, Our struggles are not against the flesh and the blood. Our struggle is not against those people. It's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our fight is against the evil that corrupts, that comes in beside you, that deceives you. Oh, that's a nice movie. We can watch that as a family. You know, I get it. We're all just trying to make our way past through this world so we can get to that mansion in the sky. It's not how it works. Jesus calls us to change and be the change as we make that journey. Being a Christian is hard, it's not for the faint at heart. Being a Gideon and confronting idolatry around us is hard. But the Lord reminds us of what he told Joshua. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We're constantly bombarded with messages that contradict our faith. They discourage us and they they even tempt us to give in to the other side. That's why church attendance is 43%. Too many have been tempted to the other side. But when you gave your heart to Christ, he called you. 
He called you to be his light in the world. He called you to be the protector of the children. We're called to extend love, compassion, and mercy. But we're also called to stand against injustice and to fight for what's right, even when it's difficult. We're called to be the beacons of hope in a world that desperately needs it. And when God comes to call us again, us, his modern day Gideons, we should only answer one way. Here I am, Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, it's Thank you. Thank you for insisting I give this message in your house. Because maybe this is the only place it can be heard. Thank you for the heaviness that's on this congregation. Because that means they heard your words. Thank you for the heaviness of the message so that it may be a call to action. And Lord, son, most everyone here doesn't even know what they would do next. But we all know we just have to clean up our own homes. We have to find our way back to you. We have to find a way to be a family that loves God, that loves your son, who died on the cross so that we could have the eternal life after we spread his light through this world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.